Good evening and uh, welcome to another uh, event from the Living Earth TV and we're celebrating the Bialtana Living Earth um, Festival uh, where we celebrate biodiversity and our natural heritage. Bialtana of course comes from the Irish word uh, for the month of May and it's called after a, a um, I'm here, uh, sorry, it's called after a the ancient Celtic festival of Bialtana, which is when our ancient ancestors celebrated uh, the arrival of spring and summer and growth and uh, that the nature and the living earth would give forth its bounty once again. And of course, our ancient ancestors were so uh, closely reliant on um, the living earth now i'm sorry i'm a bit hesitant i'm hearing something in my ears that i shouldn't be hearing and uh, hopefully you're not hearing that i'm sorry we were late on the air <clears throat> we had trouble with our streaming but uh, we have a very important show uh, today for today we celebrate world b day now we had a foretaste of this uh, last evening when we were talking to uh, Ray Sinnott and Liam Lysett, and we were we had an abundance of flowers from uh, the Mount Congreve estate, and then Liam Lysett uh, talked about uh, the importance of pollinators, and we watched that uh, lovely video from uh, Una Fitzpatrick in the National Biodiversity Data Centre. Now we're going to continue on that vein, of course, because, uh, celebrating World Bee Day. And uh, we've been sent in a poem by uh, our friends in the National Park and Wildlife Service, and it's written by Gillian Stewart. Um, <clears throat> it's, uh, it's called The Humble Bee. And uh, it goes like this. I'm just a humble bumblebee. I do not ask for much. I only want some rough to nest and wildfires flowers for my lunch. And in return, I pollinate all fruit and veg galore. And if you think that I need you, I know you need me more. And that's a, a nice uh, note to start on because uh, we're celebrating the bees and the bees need our help. Uh, but the bees are helping us and we learn a bit more about that during the show. I'll be joined uh, later on by Yvonne Grace, who's a horticulture lecturer at Waterford Institute of Technology, and Ian Edwards, who's the head education guide in the uh, Glendalock uh, National Park. Um, but before we do that, we look at some uh, pictures we've got in. Uh, we're getting... Uh, nice response uh, on social media and on email and uh, we've been asking you uh, all week to send in your pictures uh, to share with everyone else and if we don't get uh, a chance to uh, share them on screen uh, other people can see them anyway on Facebook and Twitter etc. So this is the winner of our uh, competition for today and this is a lovely close-up of a bee and this one is from Tony Penkert uh, and he sent us that on Facebook Messenger so thank you very much Tony and we will send you a family pass for an OPW site. Now many of you are worrying about uh, the fate of bumblebees and uh, all bees and pollinators and uh, we must remain positive on this and uh, if things go really bad uh, there is a research group uh, up in Kings Court in County Cavan who have been working on an alternative solution to save uh, mankind so if we can't save the bees uh, don't worry we have some research going on up there and this is from Catherine and Francis up in Kings Court and they have made a special beehive for robot bees and they also have set up a robot pollinator so this is really good news for the future and there is the robot pollinator out pollinating the plants so that's really great from Catherine and Francis keep up the good work uh, but in the meantime of course we will save all the bees and we will uh, we will uh, 
follow the national pollinator plan and help the bees so um also we want uh, we want uh, people to send in more uh, photographs and comments and questions and uh, you can send them in on twitter on instagram facebook or you can email us of course as well so um we will now uh, we're now ready for our special visit of the day and this is to the um national biodiversity data center we had um Liam Lysett, the director, on with us uh, yesterday evening, and now we'll have a a <clears throat> um, a talk from um, the uh, bee expert Thomas Murray, who's going to uh, in this video he talks about bumblebees and about this how people can get involved um, as citizen scientists and help find out more information about the bumblebees and other. Uh, other uh, biodiversity. So bees are a wonderful group of insects that are thoroughly deserving of conservation in their own right, but they also provide this fantastic and free service of pollination. So when a bee visits um, a flower that we uh, consume the product of in some way, either a fruit or a vegetable or nuts or oils, um, we can measure that value to agriculture. In Ireland that's 53 million euro per annum. But they also visit a whole variety of other wildflowers, shrubs and trees. Uh, again within Ireland over three quarters of our plants require bee pollination for the reproduction. So they maintain effectively our terrestrial ecosystems. So not only are they thoroughly deserving of conservation in their own right, they provide this essential ecosystem service of pollination. So what type of bees do we have in Ireland? Well, we have 99 different types of bee in Ireland, 77 of which are solitary bees, one of which is the honeybee, which most people immediately think of when they think of bees, but we also have 21 bumblebee species. So with our bumblebees, they're cold adapted species, they're the big, fat, hairy bees that you see flying about, uh, particularly in springtime you see the really large queens, but the really, really big hairy ones that you see on flowers, there are bumblebees. So how are they doing? I mean, we're very conscious at the moment of declines in honeybee populations, but I think what has really gotten out there now, primarily driven with the pollinator plan and, and, and similar uh, initiatives worldwide, is that our wild bee populations aren't doing too well too. We effectively found that over half our species have dramatic declined since the 1980s. And out of our 99 species, one third of them are currently under threat of extinction. And then more specifically with our bumblebees, out of the 20 bumblebees that we had at the time, we now have 21, um, out of the 20 bumblebees that we had at the time, six are under threat of extinction, with another three uh, falling within a near threatened category. So almost half our bumblebees are also under threat of extinction. So um, again, it's of significant concern. It isn't just media hype. We're genuinely concerned about how our bumblebees are doing in Ireland. So there are loads of ways of reversing these declines in bees, and they're all outlined within the All-Ireland Pollinator Plan and the sectoral guidelines and all those really detailed how-to guides, um, all available to download from pollinators.ie. But in parallel to all those interventions to uh, reverse these declines, we also need a really good way of measuring how our bees are doing each year. So in how many wild bees are flying in the Irish landscape each year. And that's where the bumblebee monitoring scheme slots in. So the scheme itself would have been uh, trialled in 2011. And had the first field season in 2012 with 28 brave souls um, across 36 sites. And it has now grown to uh, 78 people across 102 sites across Ireland. So it's, it's fantastic. I think last year we recorded over uh, 13,000 um, individual bumblebees and another 4,000 honeybees actually along with that too. But there are still many parts of Ireland where we don't have anybody monitoring and we really don't know how those populations are doing. So we really do need more help. We need more people out there actually helping us monitor those bees because it's the only way we'll have a, a, a good measure of how our bees are doing every single year, how many bees are flying in the landscape. So what is monitoring? How do we do it? Well, overall, it's walking a fixed route over known time and then repeating that walk 
every month from April until October. So it's around eight walks per year. So when you want to get into bumbling monitoring, we're really only asking for eight hours of your time every single year. Step one, a really basic one, is get to know your bumblebees. Learning their identification is really the very first step along uh, actually becoming a fully fledged bumblebee monitor. And so the easiest way of doing that is just getting out straight away and having a look at what bees are in your garden or in around you. Um, we have a whole variety of resources again for free to download from the pollinators.ie website. Um, we even give um, all the slides that we typically present at our identification workshops. All those slides again are freely available to download from our website. Um, also from the Biodiversity Ireland online shop, we have an identification swatch, a bumblebee identification swatch, that can help you too. So we also run um, a series of free workshops every single year, teaching people exactly that, how to identify bumblebees and how to monitor them too. So just keep a look on our uh, uh, pollinators.ie, the events webpage there, and you'll see if there's a, a workshop near you that you'd like to come along to. After that, it's just yourself, get out. Uh, we typically find those who do best are those who go out and maybe catch and release a lot. And again, we can show you how to do that without harming yourself or harming the bee. But it's ultimately having a container, at least three quarters full of tissue paper, and catching a bee, having a decent look, maybe even taking a photograph, and then letting the bee go. So either catching and releasing quite a lot, or taking lots of photographs. So the two best ways of really accelerating your skill with bumblebees. So step two then is actually deciding, well, okay, I'd like to do monitoring, so where am I going to walk? And for us, you can choose anywhere you'd like. Now, I would suggest you take, again, a quick look at the website and see if there's anybody walking very close to you. It would be great if we could try and space people out so there's not so much overlap between walks. You can walk anywhere, and if you have a particular route that you enjoy walking, and we really emphasize that, we want people to uh, go somewhere they already like walking, and then you just add bumblebee identification onto it, or bumblebee monitoring onto it, and it just increases your enjoyment. So it's never a chore, it's just something that adds to your enjoyment of walking. Choose somewhere that you enjoy and also somewhere that's convenient. Again, the convenience is important because that way you will be able to run out when the weather suits and actually be able to do the bumblebee monitoring scheme too. So enjoyment and convenience. For us, the only criteria then we really insist on is that that walk is at least one kilometre in length. So something that you can do in roughly around 45 minutes or an hour or a lunch break if you're working. Then we ask you to break it up into different sections. Typically five sections, but maybe up to 15. And so the way that works is, okay, section one of my walk would be from my front door, around my garden, and maybe to, to the gate. Uh, section two then would be from the gate down to the corner of the road. Section three then would be down the road, down a small little laneway, and then across a the field. So you break up the sections into areas of relatively homogeneous habitats, or you know, broad areas that are similar to each other, and break it up accordingly. Then step three is, once you've identified your route, um, is to tell us about it. So on the pollinators.ie website, there's a section for the bumblebee monitoring scheme. So you can go in there, there's a big button saying get involved, and all the details about how to register are within there. So when you're registering your walk, uh, we just need specific details. So you can give a name to your walk, if you want to call it a particular thing. Um, there's a map provided, so you can tell us specifically where the centre of your walk is. And um, you tell us about the length of your walk. But most importantly is you have an opportunity there to draw specifically in every single section of your walk. So we know where you start and where you finish for every single section. After that then, it's just getting out there and monitoring your bumblebees. And then once you have that online account with us, it's going back to that account every single month and putting in your bumblebee records directly into that account. So we have that central registry of everything that you're seeing along your walk. So when we go out and we start monitoring, we're actually monitoring within a five meter cube, like an imaginary box. And it's a standard method used in pollard walks, or these standard walks for uh, monitoring insect populations. And so as you walk along, you're imagining that two and a half meters either side of you, and then roughly five meters in front and five meters above, you're recording all the bumblebees that come in within that imaginary box. The aim then is to walk at an even pace. So you don't want to go too slowly in particular sections or too fast in other sections. Just try and keep in or maintain a very even pace. And then also then to be as consistent as possible across months and then hopefully across years too. So we can, every single month, uh, the records that you have are comparable, one, along your walk, but also to everybody else's walk too, who are all following exactly the same standardised protocol. To help you at the start, we have these particular forms, these weekly recording forms that you can download from the website. 
And on these forms, it really just helps you, uh, it teaches you the discipline of, sort of systematically recording insects for these walks. Because on the form, we ask you for the time that you start, the time that you finish, um, the date, uh, the average temperature, the time that you're walking, the average wind speed, there's a little uh, uh, Beaufort wind scale there that you can fill out, um, and the average wind direction. And then for each section, you're going out recording all the species that you saw in each section, and the number of each of those species that you saw, the number of individuals of each species, and also whether they were male, queens or workers. And we find that those forms are really useful at the start to get people into the discipline of monitoring uh, bumblebees. But after maybe three or four months, people just prefer to take out a small notebook and that's just fine. It's just good at the start to get into that sort of discipline of taking down all those different details that we need to know each time you go out walking. After that then, the only other tip I can give is at the start, I'd suggest catch and release frequently. So again, you don't have to have an insect net. If you have a large vessel, or again, like a jam jar, that you fill three quarters full of tissue paper, just getting a bee into that jar allows you to have a decent look. After that then, if you're really good with the smartphone, you can take a photograph. The advantage again of a photograph is that you can look at it at a computer screen and when you get home and look at it really large and have a really detailed look. And again, if you're still not sure, then you can post that up on our Facebook page or you can email us directly. And we can identify it for you and then gives you some additional pointers then when you go back outside um, looking for bumblebees. On average within Ireland, we typically only have six species in any one location. So it can go up to 14 on the really good sites, but that's a rarity. So for you as a bumblebee recorder, it's just really getting to know those six core species well. And then once you do get to know them, those rare species will be much easier to identify. So it's a very accessible group of insects to learn if you want to get into insect monitoring in any way. And again, there's nothing better to just getting outside and giving it a go. And at the start, you're going to get it right and you're going to get it wrong. At least you're outside and you're helping us monitor these very important insects. Now, um, that was a fascinating video there uh, with Thomas Murray from the National Biodiversity Data Centre. And uh, him, he and uh, we saw Una Fitzpatrick's um, video yesterday. And the National Biodiversity Data Centre are doing really important work uh, in this because the, we can't um, help bees and uh, other biodiversity unless we know what's happening. and. Uh, who, who's out there uh, are, and what are the numbers and what, uh, what are the trends? So that's really important. Um, now, the video showed us there about getting involved and about doing things for biodiversity. And I'm in, joined by uh, two guests tonight. Uh, first is Ian Edwards, who's the head education guide of the Wicklow Mountains uh, National Park. And he works out of the education center in Glendalough, and I'm sure most people know Glendalough. If you haven't been there, you know by reputation, and uh, the most one of the most beautiful places in the world, and uh, that's a, a nice place to have your office. Uh, but I'm sure Ian prefers to be out of the office uh, in the out in the open air. There, uh, Ian has led a number of bumblebee walks over the years as part of this uh, the bumblebee survey. And Yvonne Grace is a horticultural lecturer at Waterford Institute of Technology, and she uh, teaches biodiversity and beekeeping and pollinating studies uh, <clears throat> to our future growers and horticulturalists. So you're both very welcome. And I might go to you first, Ian, and uh, <clears throat> ask you, firstly, uh, what's been happening in the National Park during the lockdown? Has there been has it been much different? Is there any changes? Yeah, so um, when the travel restrictions came into place, um, we suddenly, you know, after St. Patrick's Day, we, we had a lot of visitors on St. Patrick's Day. Um, and uh, more than the, the car parks and facilities could really cope with. Um, and then after the restrictions came into place and car parks were closed, um, very few people here at all, you know, just local people within 2K radius using using the valley for, for you know, a bit of exercise. 
very quiet, very eerie. Um, so the sense of foreboding, you know, it was very empty and eerie. And then we got used to it. So we got used to coming in um, and, uh, and, 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 and just noticing uh, nature, noticing the spring migrant birds arriving. Um, and it was quiet and peaceful and tranquil. And we had, you know, it was a, kind of a privilege really to be, to be working on, on, uh, and, and, and under this, this, this lockdown here in Glendalough, where a lot of people are not have access to, to the outdoors. So it's been kind of wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, in terms of you have led, uh, Bumblebee walks, you're part of the, uh, Bumblebee survey. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what you've done in Glendalough and what you have seen? Yeah, so yeah, I work with a, a small team of, of education guides. Um, there's, uh, there's, there's six of us. Um, we run an education program that's free for, for schools and colleges. Um, it's been going since the, the early 1990s. Um, so with... Uh, that's what we do Monday to Friday. Yeah. And we also have a small information office um, that is open to uh, members of the public to drop by. Um, we have the walking trail trails that, that start just outside the information office, officially start just outside the information office. There's nine of those Waymark trails. So that's always very popular. Um, so yeah, we, we've, I've had, as part of our events uh, program, um, we, we often do walks and watches. Uh, so bat watches, uh, falcon watches, deer rut watches, and then flower walks and, uh, and bumblebee and butterfly walks. Um, it was something I was always interested in, uh, bumblebees, uh, when I first started uh, back here in about 2006. Um, I think we're all pretty familiar with bumblebees and they've got quite a lot of goodwill. People like bumblebees, um, but um, I really didn't know how many we had or how to identify them. Um, so when the National Biodiversity Data Center started running um, bumblebee, um, identification workshops as part of the monitoring program well you know i jumped on board there and, and uh, that's really where i got a lot of my um field skills from is is is, is attending the uh, the national biodiversity data uh, workshops and also using their um really good little bumblebee swatch uh, which is available online um, at biodiversity island.e it's fantastic yeah yeah I and mean, this is uh i must admit i did a bumblebee identification workshop with the Biodiversity Data Centre uh, several years ago as part of our Bialtana Living Earth Festival, and uh, I found it fascinating. But I yeah. must admit, within a, within a few days, I was all confused again. But it doesn't stop me enjoying bumblebees when I see them, and it's just it's just amazing to see them go from flower to flower, um, and uh, they're just it's such a lovely thing to have around. I, I really find it uh, it's it's. Uh, fascinating just watching them so even if you don't know the names of them um maybe you know you can still you can still enjoy them but um learning more about nature um doesn't lessen the wonder in any way it just increases the wonder and there is with the internet um, and with wonderful services like your own education service and um, the biodiversity data center there's so much information there to learn um and uh, it, it's a wonderful time. I remember when I was young, I was very interested in uh, wildlife, but I had maybe a, one book on birds and uh, a book on trees. And But now on your phone, you have so much information. Um, so it, it is great to get involved. But getting involved in, um, in bumblebee surveys and other such uh, surveys, is performing a very important role as well in terms of you're contributing to the science it's not just you're observing you're actually feeding that information um into the scientists who you, you where it's very very important to form this big picture of what's happening with biodiversity in ireland yeah i think um if you can uh, learn to identify the bumblebees and, and uh, take part in the Bumblebee, all island bumblebee monitoring scheme. That, that's one way to help bumblebees is by tracking the, the numbers um, and seeing whether they're in, increasing, decreasing, stable, what's happening really. And they're indicators of, of a healthy or an unhealthy environment, you know, which we are a part of. So they're like, a, they're very important from that, that point of view. They're very important for pollinating. Um, and, and also the other thing we can do is, you know, we can provide, we can provide habitat for them too in, in our own gardens, even if it's a small garden. Uh, there's quite a lot you can do that 
actually not only costs nothing, but actually could you could actually save money uh, by doing by doing some some of these uh, actions. Yeah, I, I left my um, I got 0.9 of an acre, and I just let most of it grow. Lot grow. I didn't cut it last year. Mm. Uh, I cut it in September, so I had a wildflower meadow, um, and I had all this life instead of this. This, this green kind of desert, this uniform, closely cropped lawns, which do look nice. I had I had um, uh, wild grasses and, and wildflowers, clumps and patches of different different species of wild um, uh, grass and and uh, and flowers. And it was just very diverse, very mixed. And I had butterflies, I had um, grasshoppers, and I had uh, bumblebees, and uh, yeah, it was wonderful. Uh, so yeah, actually saving money, you know, and time. I didn't have to mow the lawn. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> I'm with you there. Um, we were talking about that last, uh, uh, I think it was yesterday, and I was saying that it's more socially acceptable now to have a, have, have a, a, an unkempt garden, a wonderful wild garden. And this is a good play, time to bring Yvonne in because Yvonne, uh, you know exactly what we should be growing to help uh, our pollinators. And so maybe you tell us just for people um, with, an, with a, a normal, uh, suburban garden maybe what people could be doing yeah and um, no problem at all i've been enjoying working from home myself and looking at what's emerging in the garden and we've had all the natural or the wild flowers come through so apron and may is fantastic for that and i left a patch on moon as well and you have this the uh, the red clover at the moment in flower, I don't know if you can see it. But your long tail or long tongued bumblebees love the red clover. So it's nice if you can leave a patch. But if you can't leave a patch and you have a flower border, um, it's lovely to put in perennials. So we're starting to see our lupins coming now. So the bumblebees love these. They're able to use their weight to lower that lip and get in there and get the pollen and the nectar. Um, I also have loads of Nikita, or it's called cat mint, because they think cats like to roll around in it. They get a kind of a, an effect from it, shall we say, but that's all coming into flower now as well. And really, really easy to go, grow and really low maintenance. Um, all our common daisies have been left. You can see them in the verges around Waterford City and on campus even when you don't mow. But this is the oxide daisy, the larger daisy. So our hoverflies and our shorter tongue bees like to, to come and visit these and get their nectar and pollen. So really, if you have a small patch, whether it's a container or a border in your garden, the more kind of different shapes of flowers you can have, the better, because you'll have the different insects visiting them. So Aquilegia is in flower at the moment, it's Granny's Bonnet, and it's starting to go to seed. So if you know anyone that grows um, flowers, you know, these kind of perennials in their garden or a cottage style garden, ask them to save you some seed for next year and you can put them into your own. I have a fairly impressive, I don't know if can you see it, big poppy at the moment. And when the bumblebees go in here, they practically have a bath in nectar. They are in pollen, I should say, but I don't know, can you see it there, but it's full of black pollen and they absolutely, they just crawl around, they're covered in it and they can bring that back then for their stores. So that would be my thing. Don't get hung up on the different kind of names of plants and trying to kind of, you know, get different shapes of plants and look in your garden centre, go ask the experts and tell them you want to create a space in your garden or you want to mix in with your ornamentals. Um, flowers that will benefit our, our bees and our butterflies. But I have this in flower at the moment, our foxglove, I think everyone would know that. Um, that's in the polytunnel, so it's a little bit warmer in there. But the bumblebees love coming up in here. So if you've decided to take part in the fit, the monitoring, um, the insect count in the next little while, if you have a hedgerow with the foxglove in it, you will definitely, definitely get good pictures of our, our common bumblebee, our bombus terrestris, going in there because he can climb right in and go back into the nectary. So as Una was saying in the video yesterday, you know, they need a lot of energy to fly around and to carry that big fluffy body around the place. So so they go to these flowers that have deep nectaries that they can get a good long drink. Um, so that's my kind of... Well, I hear about um, uh, projects um, to uh, keep bees in places like inner city Dublin. 
So maybe yeah. if you hadn't got a garden, um, what if you had a a just a window box or that's what, yeah. what would you put in the window box? Um, I'd really recommend any of our herbs. So um, lavender is amazing. My lavender is just kind of coming now. The spikes are there, but they haven't kind of produced flowers yet. Really low maintenance. Um, thyme, this is a, a little sprig of thyme at the moment that's starting to flower. Um, lemon balm, any of the mints, oregano. Oregano has taken over my garden, um, so it's better in a container or a window box, to be honest. And it'll flower away now for the whole month of June, and the bees absolutely love that. Um, our honey bees love it, our solitary bees love it because they don't have to go too deeply um, into the flowers. So I would say for low maintenance, for um, containers or, or planters or herbs, you can't go wrong. Um, there's another lovely one, poached eggplant, this one. Um, a local beekeeper lives near me and he put it um, at the base of his hedgerow across the road from his house and it's absolutely it's really impressive every year you see it but it's covered in bees as well so ask at your local garden centre and they will have all the kind of prairie plants are coming into flower now your sunflowers helenium um, helianthus um, echinaceas and things like that and they will bring you right through into july august september flowering so and wonderful, of course, if you're growing your own herbs, um, they, they of course taste much nicer than the um, the dried herbs. Um, yeah. You you mentioned about your uh, neighbours. Um, I recall hearing that um, in in Ireland under the Brehan Law, our ancestors, of course, bees were bees and honey were very important, and uh, they have heard that if the bees were coming into their neighbors, your neighbor's bees were coming into your flowers and drinking your flowers for a few years, you were entitled to the next swarm from that hive. So. <laughs> yeah, or, or they should bring you a jar of honey anyway, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, Ian, the, the, yeah. we were talking about, of course, the bumblebee, um, as you say, is, is everyone's fond of the bumblebee. And I described it yesterday as the panda of the insect world. Um, but what about the solitary bees? How are they? How are they coping? And um, tell us a little bit about them. Yeah, so there's 98 species of wild bee in Ireland, um, and 77 of those are solitary bees. So they we've solitary bees, we've the domesticated honeybee, and we have our 21 species of wild bumblebee. Um, they all have very different life cycles. So um, the honeybee is perennial. You know, there's a queen, she lives for quite a long time. She has hundreds of thousands, well, tens of thousands of workers, which are her daughters. Um, they collect nectar, dehydrate it and store it as honey as a food source for the winter. It's really clever. Um, then we have the, um, the bumblebee, which is a, a solitary species, which is a, um, a social species with a, a queen who emerges out of hibernation uh, in the spring. Uh, she uh, starts the nest and um, her, her daughters that she rears become a workforce who bring food, nectar and pollen back into the nest uh, to feed their, to feed their um, sisters. And the whole idea is this colony grows in size over the, over the summer um, and then these, um, uh, the queen will produce uh, new queens and males and then the colony breaks down. Um, the males will leave the nest, mate with uh, queens from another colony, and um, these mated queens then go into hibernation. So it dies, it's an annual cycle for the, for the um, bumblebees. So I'm explaining that just to put the solitary bees in context. So the solitary bees, which most of our wild bees are solitary bees, um, 77 species, um, and they, they may nest in big aggregations, but essentially there are no queens or workers. You have males and females. So the, the males would not often emerge um, in the in the in the spring, um, uh, followed by the females. They mate. The males die. The females will then dig a hole in the ground or in some masonry. There's mining bees and cavity um, nesting bees, and they um, then she will provision that with with uh, with with uh, pollen uh, in a little cell, and she seals it up. She dies, um, and then the larva will go through a life cycle. Um, egg larva, pupa, pupa, and will emerge as, as, a, uh, as a male or a female in the following year. So that, that's how that works for the solitaries. We've got one that I've been, that was three are actually, um, of the 77, three are, are extinct. 
except one actually, um, which what, I don't think it had, had been seen since the 1920s. Um, and uh, it's, it's, uh, it, it actually reappeared in, uh, in, in some gardens. And it's a little mining bee. Um, uh, it's called Andrina uh, uh, fulva. And it, it reappeared, so the, the tawny mining bee. And it reappeared in, in the garden in Wicklow uh, that I know of. And I was really privileged to, to see this, what was extinct and has reappeared in the Irish landscape um, in this person's um, garden, which I'm not disposed to say where it is. Um, okay. But yeah, so they, so that, that was wonderful. That was really great that this little thing we, we thought it was extinct actually um, was, um, was living un, under, under our noses, you know, in, in a garden um, and then a few other sites as well in Ireland. So yeah, that's, um, there's one I'm very familiar with, which is called the Ashy Mining Bee. Um, um, and it's uh, a, a, another mining bee, so it mines in little sort of southeast facing um, uh, uh, slopes, so uh, bare of, of any vegetation, and they, they mine a little hole in, and uh, they're, they're cute little um, uh, sort of um, grey and black um, bees, they're quite small, a lot of our solitary bees are actually quite small and kind of inconspicuous, but and they nest in these sort of aggregations, so there'll be lots of uh, females making these little um, um, holes in the in, in sort of southeast facing slopes, um, but they they're not social. You know, they they just tend to nest in the same place, and uh, they're kind of cute. They're really inoffensive, very inconspicuous, and they, they're sort of at they're they're around at the moment. We've, we've slightly gone out of their flight season, but we're still kind of in their flight season, sort of April, May, June. Uh, so they can be seen. Little little uh, grey um, mining bees. They're really cute. Okay. That's something else to watch out for. Um, I have a text in from uh, Robin in Dublin who tells me that the Greeks believed that uh, flies came from rotting kine where bees came from dead lions. And, uh, and that might explain why the Lyle syrup uh, jars had a, a picture of bees around a lion. Um, and so throughout, in, in the past, bees were very hugely respected and say in, in Celtic, the world and i just thinking that uh, in there 1500 years ago uh, around your office there would have been beehives with the the huge monastic settlement there in glendalock so um it's uh, interesting to connect the history uh, and our present day um so just uh lastly um maybe to we'll wrap up soon uh, but Yvonne, um, are there other um, schemes that uh, that people can get involved in? I think you mentioned about an insect survey. Are there other things, uh, wildflower surveys, and are there other ways that people can get involved in uh, monitoring our biodiversity? Yeah, um, the Wildflower Association of Ireland and um, Britain, every Sunday, 8 to 9, they're on Twitter, if you're on Twitter, or maybe on Instagram as well, um, there's Wildflower Hour. So you go, you take a picture of whatever is in flower at that day and put it up there and share. And people put up the full botanical name, you know, where they, where they found it. So you learn so much. It's absolutely brilliant. So if you can look that up, um, that would be one of my top tips. Great way to learn. The wildflowers um, become a member of your gardening club as well your local gardening club and um, they set up a whatsapp group there since um, you know kind of lockdown and restrictions and things and every morning one of the members puts up um, a species of the day and says where they bought it was it on a trip to Wales or England or somewhere like that so you get a little bit of history about the plant as well where it was bought the conditions it grows in and if she has it available for sale as well so things like that you can't beat you know kind of learning from people who have been gardening for years um, so get to know who your local gardener is your local nursery um, person or you know your local um, garden centre and you'll, you'll learn lots from them so that would be my top tip but the as well the FIT with the biodiversity center that's an easy one it's a 50 by 50 centimeter square um, patch you go you look at it for 10 minutes you count how many insects visit that patch you take a picture upload it and that's just another way of building on the information of what types of insects are actually visiting what types of flowers and that way then we can encourage and, and protect those going into the future and hopefully increase numbers that's it great um Ian, have you anything to add there yeah. in terms of citizen science? 
Yeah, um, I, well, I can I can bring you a little bee. I didn't want to have any in the jars while we were talking, but if you give me, <laughs> take me about three seconds, yeah. I can nip out of the door and I'll bring you back up. Maybe <laughs> I'm a smaller species. All right. <laughs> oh, and uh, so the Ireland's smallest bee is waiting patiently uh, outside for us to finish talking so he could come in and uh, display himself to us. Um, but uh, so here we are. So this is, um, I just got this off our Catoniasta. It's got very small little pink ruddy flowers, but it, the, the, uh, the short, as it, the little short tongue species of it. And in here, um, is a very, very small bumblebee. This is a red tail species called Bombus pratorum, or the early bumblebee. Um, it colonized Ireland in the 1940s and is now one of the, one of the commonest ones. We, you know, you, most people should see these in their gardens. It's the tiniest bumblebee. You can see how small that is. You know, a white tail species would be massive compared to this. So it's a tiny little red tail, not like a bright red. Um, and it has that little yellow band um, on the top of its thorax, just below its head. So yeah, tail colour uh, is, is, is the way we identify species of bumblebees um, and also looking by the, at the number of colour bands they have on their little body. Yeah, so that's a little female worker. She's tiny. Okay. Uh, well, thanks Ian for sharing uh, your friend with us and uh, Yvonne for uh, bringing your flowers. Um, I should say that um, Ian is going to release our little friend back again yeah. and uh, always do that if you collect uh, uh, insects or the like. Um, in the video, I noticed they said that you could catch um, bees to look at and it mentioned a jam jar. I would caution strongly against using jam jars because I had my first trip to hospital at the age of five uh, when I was trying to catch a bumblebee in a jam jar. Um, lucky, luckily for the bumblebee, uh, I fell off uh, the ladder at the time, uh, but unluckily for me, I landed on the jar. <laughs> so, um, but it was funny, uh, we were, we used to catch bees and we used to make elaborate houses for them and expecting them to colonize the, our, our little houses as, <laughs> as nests as, uh, and uh, it never worked, but uh, now, young people can learn so much more about bees than I knew when I was that age. Uh, so look, thank you very much. Uh, you've shared so much with us and in National our World Bee Day, uh, we it's uh, appropriate now that we know how we can help the bees. So we know more about bees, but we also know what we can do uh, as individuals to help the bees. So thank you very much, Yvonne and Ian for uh, sharing that with us. You're welcome. Now, um, we have some uh, final announcements. Um, we have, um, again, we urge people to um, share with us what you're seeing and what you're doing as part of the festival, wherever you are in Ireland or around the world. Uh, please share with us, share with everyone else. People are very interested. Uh, to see pictures and comments from other people. Um, let's see what is coming, uh, what we have on. Um, I am in, let's see where we are. Yes, uh, we have, uh, not, to, um, not to forget the other pollinators. There's lots and lots of other pollinators. And here is a nice picture of a butterfly sent in to us from Lucia O'Donnell from Kilmalogue in Kerr, County Tipperary. And she's 12 and she is getting interested in biodiversity. And that's thank you very much, Lucia. And uh, we have guides to help you. Um, and we have activities and we just look at some of the activities for today on our website uh, we have a little activity for younger children of doing a symmetrical b and uh, we have um, a link to uh, guides or worksheets on bumblebees osgelga uh, agus osberla so in fact uh, bumbus is uh, our panel had used that term the latin term and bumbog is the uh, irish word for B, lovely word that. Um, we also, in addition to having 
uh, daily activities. We have, um, I have to bring them up here on the screen. Um, we have our guides for today, and there's uh, bumblebee guides that uh, will help you identify the 21 species of bumblebees that were mentioned. So 21 species is quite a lot, and they do look quite similar, a lot of them. Um, and uh, they're available on our website. And this is, uh, we have new guides every day. So throughout the whole festival, we'll have lots of different guides on birds, the bees, uh, trees, flora, fauna, or everything. Uh, and um, we encourage you to look at that. And we've links then to other resources from partners around the island. Um, that's our guides and uh, here is how to get in contact with us. Um, Twitter, Instagram uh, and Facebook and you can also email us at uh, Calmast. And um, so <clears throat> thank you very much for joining us again today and um, thank you very much for my guests it's just wonderful to be in the company of people who are not only expert um in a, in a field but also passionate about it so thank you very much and that's uh, true of all our guests this week and um, tomorrow um we will be looking at wellness and biodiversity and to, this week is also mental health week uh, in ireland and uh, we have drawn attention to the links, the positive links between uh, mental health and uh, biodiversity and nature. So tomorrow uh, we will be talking all about forest bathing, about wellness, about what, how to uh, experience nature and uh, in a way that is really good for your mental health. Um, our, our, um, the photographs featured today will win there, um, the submitters a family pass to an OPW site, and uh, so we encourage you to send in your pictures, uh, and we will have more prizes tomorrow again. So I just lastly check my phone quickly for any last-minute uh, reminders or emails from anyone, and uh, we just—it's just all positive. Uh, compliments and I just get too embarrassed to start reading them out to you. So thank you very much again. Stay home, stay safe, discover the biodiversity on your doorstep and experience the extraordinary in the ordinary. Good evening. <laughs>